world is waiting for the results from the murder trial of Derek Chauvin. How soon we can expect a verdict? A driver crashes and falls from an elevated part of 1604. We're going to tell you the driver's condition and what happened here. Live from Case at 12. The news at noon starts right now. Our top story at noon, health experts with the European Union say they found a, quote, possible link between the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and blood clots. And that's why the European Union says a warning about a rare blood clot could be on the label for the vaccine. However, they still say it's a very rare side effect of the vaccine. Last week, Johnson & Johnson halted its European rollout of the vaccine after U.S. officials recommended a pause. Six blood clot cases out of seven million who received the vaccine are reported so far. The Alamodome drive through COVID vaccine clinic will be open in less than two hours. City officials made the announcement yesterday. You don't need an appointment, but you must be 16 years or older. The clinic will be open from 2 p.m. till 5 p.m. today through Saturday. Today is the first day for the clinic. According to city officials, more than 779,000 people have received at least one dose of the vaccine. Now to the latest on the murder trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. The jurors now deliberating today after a long day of closing arguments on Monday. Security has stepped up in the Minneapolis area in anticipation of the verdict, which could come down at any moment. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest from Minneapolis. Tuesday, all eyes on the 12 jurors responsible for deciding Derek Chauvin's fate. It is your duty to decide the questions of fact in this case. The diverse jury, ages ranging from 20s to 60s, five men and seven women, four black, six white, and two self-identify as multiracial. They heard nearly three weeks of testimony from 45 witnesses and six hours of closing arguments from both sides Monday. Mr. Chauvin should be found not guilty of all counts. What the defendant did to George Floyd killed him. Prosecutors arguing Chauvin used unreasonable, deadly force even as bystanders begged him to stop and then failed to render medical aid. For nine minutes and 29 seconds, the defendants wait on him, desperately crying out, a grown man crying out for his mother. The defense blaming George Floyd's drug use and heart issues for his death, saying Chauvin did what he was trained to do. And a reasonable police officer would consider whether to use an additional force to overcome the suspect's level of resistance. In rebuttal, the prosecution leaving jurors with these final words. You were told, um, for example, that Mr. Floyd died, that Mr. Floyd died because his heart was too big. And the truth of the matter is that the reason George Floyd is dead is because Mr. Chauvin's heart was too small. Outside the courthouse, hundreds of protesters demanding justice for George Floyd. Ahead of the verdict, businesses boarded up, National Guard members on standby, and local schools going remote starting Wednesday. The governor here says civil unrest cannot be allowed, but that communities in pain need to be heard, and that systemic change needs to happen. Rena Roy, ABC News, Minneapolis. San Antonio police need your help identifying a murder suspect's vehicle that was seen on surveillance video. Take a look at it. The video shows a gray SUV. The murder happened last Monday around 2.20 in the morning in the 600 block of East Evergreen Street. 38-year-old Jesus Cardenas was shot while he was riding his bike. Anyone with information about the suspect's vehicle or the case is being asked to call SAPD Homicide. At the number on your screen, it is 210207. 7635. A driver is in the hospital after a dramatic crash, one that may have left her with a story to tell in the future. She survived when her car fell off an elevated section of Loop 1604 in Stone Oak. And as Katrina Weber reports, San Antonio police say it looks like drowsy driving is to blame. This smashed car is an eye opening sight, but San Antonio police say it seems the driver's eyes were closed. They say the woman behind the wheel told them she fell asleep around 5 this morning as she headed west on Loop 1604 near Stone Oak Parkway. The next thing anyone knew, she was airborne, heading for the open space between the two sides of the highway. 
Her car had a hard landing far below the overpass. Even without the car here, you can still see the path it took after it came off this elevated highway. The marks in the middle of the street show where it landed. From there, it bounced up and hit the wall. And the stains show how it slid down to the bottom. Somehow the driver was able to tell police all about it. They say she was alert and talking as she was loaded into an ambulance. Her trip to a hospital, police say, was to make sure she hadn't suffered any serious injuries. The woman's car was totaled and towed away. Police say she told them working too many hours took a toll on her, unfortunately, while she was driving. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. A GPS tracker in a truck helped to lead San Antonio police straight to the suspects who stole it, but not before police had to chase the suspects down. The owner discovered his work truck was gone sometime this morning, but he informed police about the GPS tracker. The police quickly found the suspects who refused to stop, resulting in a chase. Eventually, the suspects ditched the truck and ran into the woods on Markham near Old Highway 90. Police used their helicopter to search for them. Two people were eventually caught. We also have an update uh, to give you about a shooting on Dexrid on the southeast side. We told you about it, this story on the night beat last night. We now know the name of the suspect. 30 year old Tristar Mathis is facing an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon charge. Police received that call around seven o'clock about a shooting. When police got to the scene, they found a woman had been shot. She was taken to the hospital. Witnesses told police that Mathis and the woman had gotten into a physical fight. Then witnesses say they saw Mathis take out a gun and shoot the woman. Day two of early voting happening today. Residents casting their vote for the May 1st election. And so far, a little over 7,000 people have voted. Polling sites have been open since 8 a.m. today and will close at 6 p.m. Early voting will last until next Tuesday, April 27th. A major item on the ballot this year is Proposition B. And that's the topic of this week's new episode of KSAT Explains. If approved, Prop B would repeal the San Antonio Police Union's right to collectively bargain. We lay out what Prop B would and wouldn't accomplish if passed and fact check arguments both for and against it. KSAT Explains. Prop B will be live streamed at 7 p.m. tonight on KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app and the KSAT Facebook page. To see more of our election coverage like the mayoral forum we did last week, just head over to ksat.com slash vote 2021. Even in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic, the number one killer for women is something that may be more worrisome. With more on that, here's ABC's Ike Jachi. Heart disease continues to be the leading cause of death in women in the United States. That's according to the CDC. One in five American women die from heart disease, which is often undetected until there's an emergency, like a heart attack. Symptoms may include pain or fluttering in the chest, pain in the neck and upper back, trouble breathing, heartburn, fatigue, and or feet swelling. There are many things that women can do to decrease the risk of heart disease. The CDC recommends cutting back on alcohol and quitting tobacco smoking. Regular exercise, eating a healthy diet, and managing stress are also key. Women should also consult with their doctors about their blood pressure and any concerns about diabetes, as these can put them at risk for heart disease. With this Medical Minute, I'm Ike Jaji. Still ahead on the news at noon, we now know the official cause of death of the police officer at the Capitol who died days after the insurrection. What this could mean for those on trial. And the Spurs are coming home after going 2-0 and on their latest road trip. Patty Mills bringing home a win and a little headache. We'll explain coming up. And after the break, we're going to take a look at all of the achievements of former Vice President Walter Mondale. Now to celebrating the life of former Vice President Walter Mondale. Mondale, a champion of civil rights, served under President Jimmy Carter for his one term in office and was considered the first VP to be a genuine partner to the president. Here's ABC's Mary Bruce. With his pick for vice president in 1984, Walter Mondale made history, choosing Geraldine Ferraro, who became the first woman on the presidential ticket of a major party, shattering a glass ceiling with Mondale by her side. 
But Mondale's career of service started long before that watershed moment. He served his country in the Korean War, was Minnesota's attorney general, and spent 12 years in the U.S. Senate, all before becoming Jimmy Carter's running mate in 1976. the office. Which I am As vice president, he began the tradition of weekly lunches with the president. Overnight, President Biden saying it was Walter Mondale who defined the vice presidency as a full partnership and helped provide a model for my service. And in 1984, Vice President Mondale made his run for president with Ferraro, but the pair struggled to overcome opponent Ronald Reagan's lead. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. Reagan eventually winning in a landslide. Mondale's dedication to service admired still. In a statement overnight, former President Carter saying, I mourn the passing of my dear friend Walter Mondale, who I consider the best vice president in our country's history. That was Mary Bruce reporting. After his White House years, Mondale served from 1993 to 96 as President Bill Clinton's ambassador to Japan. He fought for U.S. access to markets ranging from cars to cellular phones. San Antonio entering stage two water restrictions today. Here's what you need to know. Irrigation times are reduced to 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. or 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. Your day determined by the last number of your street address. Handheld watering is allowed at any time of the day, though. For more information, we have an article on our website right now that can tell you when you can automatically water. Just head to ksat.com. And that takes us outside with live cam. It's already 75 degrees and no rain in sight today, but maybe, maybe that'll change later on. In the Ooh, we are hoping for by the end of the week to see some rain here in San Antonio. As Ursula was just mentioning, stage two water restrictions go into effect today. The aquifer took another dip down seven tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours, now down to 648.8 feet above sea level. Again, those stage water, stage two water restrictions go into effect today. In the pollen count, not too bad. Molds and oak continue to fall. Mold is moderate at 600. Oak is moderate at 150. And pecan is low at 20. In the forecast, we are going to talk about that chance for rain on Friday. But the first thing, knock, knock, knocking on our door. Look at that cold front. 39 degrees in Amarillo in April, 40 in Lubbock. Meanwhile, it's near 80 degrees in Brownsville, and we'll get up into the 80s here in San Antonio before that front moves through. I'll walk you through what that front means for our forecast tomorrow, coming up after the break. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather, streaming free on KSAT TV. We are on the lookout for some rain. We need it badly. Stage two starting up yep. and you have some hope for us. Right. You know, the last time we were in stage two water restrictions was June of 2018. So it's been a while since the aquifer has been this low. We need rain, but it's going to be a hit or miss situation on Friday for many folks and not a washout by any means just yet. We're not confident in that. However, there is a chance for rain in the forecast and that's always some good news. Let's go ahead and take a look outside 73 sunny degrees out there. Hard to find a cloud in the sky. Dew points are in the 40s. It's nice and dry south winds at 5 to 10 miles per hour. But give it about, um, I would say, probably eight hours, and those winds are going to be very gusty from the north as we see a front move through. Outside right now, again, no clouds in the sky. This is a look at the radar and the satellite picture. Everybody dealing with total sunshine. You got to get north of Fredericksburg to even see a cloud in the sky there. Uh, it's very dry too with that low humidity. This is our friend and our enemy, the low humidity, because uh, it's making it feel great outside, but we need that low level moisture to produce any kind of rain. And if we had a little bit more moisture at the surface, we would have had potentially a possibility to see some rain from this approaching front to our north, uh, but it's going to be a dry front, really just making things windy and chilly tomorrow morning. 
Right now it's 73 at San Antonio International Airport, 78 in Pleasanton, 80 warm degrees in Catula, 77 in Carrizo Springs, spring, 77 in New Braunfels and 75 in Austin. But with that low humidity, it feels great outside. Let's take a wide view here. Can you spot the cold front? I think you can. You don't need to be a meteorologist to see where the colder air is. It's 25 in Casper, Wyoming, 26 in Denver. Kansas had six inches of snow late this season here uh, for, for them to see some snowfall. 32 in Springfield. 37 in Oklahoma City and temperatures are now falling behind that front in Dallas in the 50s. Now that front is going to take its time getting here. It'll get here after dinner uh, and so we'll still have plenty of time to warm up this afternoon. High temperature in San Antonio close to 85 degrees, 83 in Uvalde, 82 in Hondo, but in the 70s uh, in uh, the hill country because that front will move through before the peak heating in the afternoon. So for the rest of the day, low humidity and warm in the 80s. Then once that front moves through around dinner. It's actually going to turn windy. Winds will gust from the north up to about 35 miles per hour tonight. So if you have any loose patio furniture outside or any kind of decorations out there, out there that get picked up by the wind, you may want to bring them in. Temperatures will fall into the 50s by midnight. Again, I'll show you that future cast that front moving through right at around dinner. Wind gusts of up to about 35 miles per hour all around the KSAT 12 viewing area. And tomorrow morning, you might actually want to bring out the heavier coat tomorrow tomorrow morning. Temperatures are going to be in the 40s. We'll be right around 45 degrees here in San Antonio, but the upper 30s in the hill country and with breezy conditions, our wind chills may dip down into the 30s tomorrow morning. So bring the coat tomorrow in the afternoon. Tomorrow temperatures will warm up to near 70, so it'll be a little bit more pleasant. You won't need the coat in the afternoon, but by Thursday we're actually going to have overcast skies, uh, areas of uh, drizzle and some light rain possible on Thursday as well, and it'll be cool with a high only in the 60s on Thursday. Then we have a better rain chance on Friday with the approach of a low pressure system. Notice how the healthier rain will likely be east of us toward Houston and north toward Dallas. But on Friday, we do have a 40% chance for scattered storms. We're going to want to pay attention to the weather on Friday because some of those storms could be strong or severe. It is the spring uh, storm season after all, in spite of the fact that we haven't seen much rain. So here's a summary of the forecast for you. Getting windy tonight getting chilly tomorrow morning 70 for the high cloudy skies on Thursday with 20% chance for light showers only in the 60s on Thursday that humidity returns on Friday that's when we'll have that 40% chance for storms some of which could be strong or severe but we'll have low humidity and comfortable afternoons for the weekend let's hope for that rain on Friday oh <laughs> let's hope we can measure it yeah thank you so much Sarah Coming up next at noon, a D.C. medical examiner revealing the actual cause of death for the Capitol Police officer who was killed. We're going to break down the results and how this could affect those who are facing charges in the riot. Also coming up as the race to vaccinate continues, Johnson & Johnson hits another setback. We've got that for you coming up and the Spurs on the road next. First wrapping up a two game road trip in Indiana last night, trying to follow up that big win over Phoenix on Saturday. This could be habit forming, getting off to a fast start. DeJounte Murray gets it to DeMar DeRosa on the break for the two handed slam. Spurs up 16 15, then Derek White starts a huge night, scores eight of the Spurs' final 10 points of the first quarter, including the three with seven seconds left. San Antonio up 36 21 after one. We go to the second quarter, more offense. Rudy Gay, wide open, Jakob Pertle. It's 42-25. That forces a Pacers timeout. Then Keldon Johnson hits a triple from the wing. The San Antonio Spurs go off to the locker room with a 55-44 lead. We go to the third quarter. Pirtle comes up with a steal and decides to lead the break himself. The point center. Johnson back to Pirtle. Spurs lead by 21. Then there is some drama. Patty Mills runs right into Indiana's Jakari Simpson. Bounces off of him. They go toe-to-toe. -to -toe, and then Sampson headbutts Patty. Technicals are handed out to both teams. Rudy Gay kind of got in there a little bit too, mixed it up. But Sampson is ejected with a flagrant two. From there, the Spurs cruise to the end. Derek White finishes with a game high 25. All five starters finish in double figures, and the Spurs win it 109 94. They are back to 500 ball. Definitely two big wins for us. Um, we always seem to play a little better on the road for some reason, but um, good wins for us, and we just got to keep this momentum going and um, not let up. I mean, seasons. Doing down, so we just got to keep battling and try to play their best basketball down the stretch. 
Hey, before the game last night, head coach Greg Popovich was asked about the team being fined $25,000 after he decided to rest DeMar DeRozan, Patty Mills, and Jakob Pertl Saturday night instead of playing them against the Suns. The league said the Spurs violated the NBA's resting players policy, which is supposed to protect high-profile games on national broadcast. But given the schedule and the pandemic, Pop was, ooh, he's not surprised that they were fined. No, not really. You know, I didn't give it much thought. We needed to rest them, so we rested them. I think we know best, you know, what our players need. You know, I understand the league's point of view, uh, and we're just going to differ on it. $25,000 worth of difference. All right, next game tomorrow night. Spurs back home where they struggle. So maybe they'll bring that road momentum with them. Tip-off is at 730 against the Miami Nice to Heat. see them winning. Yeah, that's exactly. Hey, there's a new travel destination that's aimed to be a COVID-free time. How they are using the vaccine as a way to get people in the door or on the island. Still ahead, how would you like to take a COVID test from the comfort of your own home? Well, that's going to be a reality soon. We'll explain more after the break. In a new report, the D.C. medical examiner finds that Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick actually passed away as a result of natural causes. He died a day after the insurrection. ABC's Alex Preche has more details from Washington. That's Officer Brian Sicknick on the front lines of the January 6th siege. In this video obtained exclusively by the New York Times, he's seen facing off with rioters storming the Capitol. Later, Sicknick collapsed. A day later, he died. We've waited months for his final autopsy results. The Washington, D.C. medical examiner now says while all the violence that happened that day played a role in the 42-year-old officer's condition, he died from natural causes after suffering serious strokes in his brainstem. These two men, Julian Cater of Pennsylvania and George Tanios of West Virginia, faced charges including assaulting Sicknick and other officers, allegedly seen spraying the officers with an unknown substance, a chemical irritant, possibly bear spray. One of the men seen raising his hand with that can in the direction of the officers. Sicknick can be seen backing away from the line after being hit. An affidavit said three officers, including Sicknick, were incapacitated and unable to perform their duties for at least 20 minutes or longer while they recovered from the spray. One officer said the spray was as strong as, if not stronger than, any version of the pepper spray they had been exposed to during their training. Both Cater and Tanios have pleaded not guilty. In a statement, the U.S. Capitol Police said that while they accept the medical examiner's conclusion, this does not change the fact Officer Sicknick died in the line of duty, courageously defending Congress and the Capitol. U.S. Capitol Police are continuing to work with federal authorities to make sure that all parties responsible are held accountable for that attack. And now, Oath Keepers founding member John Schaefer, as part of a plea deal, has agreed to fully cooperate with the government. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. The man charged with the murder of Kristen Smart back in 1996 is pleading not guilty. Paul Flores is facing a first degree murder charge and his father, Ruben Flores, facing an accessory charge. Both men remaining in custody at county jail in San Luis Obispo County. The judge denied bail for Paul, saying he does pose a risk to public safety and pointing out his past criminal history, including DUI and firearms arrests. Ruben's bail was reduced. The preliminary hearing is set for May 17th. Smart was abducted towards the end of her freshman year of college. Her remains were never found. As the race to vaccinate pushes forward, Johnson & Johnson is still a few steps behind. This as more states are getting rid of COVID restrictions. Here's ABC Stephanie Ramos with more on that. There's another setback in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The FDA has stopped all production at the Emergent Biosolutions plant in Baltimore after a new inspection following that major mishap last month where ingredients for up to 15 million future Johnson & Johnson vaccine doses were ruined. Now, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is still not in use as the CDC looks into an unrelated incident. Those rare blood clots found in six people after they were recently fully vaccinated 
designated. The CDC says they are investigating those cases and also several new ones to determine whether the clotting is actually related to the vaccine. Now, despite concerns, some states like Arizona are rolling back even more restrictions. Overnight, Arizona's governor announcing he is rescinding the mask mandate in grades K through 12, but also says school districts and charter schools could still mandate masks if they choose to. Stephanie Ramos, ABC News, East Rutherford, New Jersey. News of the first rapid at-home COVID test that gives results in 15 minutes will be available nationwide at pharmacies. Abbott Laboratories announcing they are shipping Binax Now tests to CVS Pharmacy, Walgreens, and Walmart to be available later this week without a prescription. The Binax Now test, which like many other COVID tests, has received the FDA's emergency use authorization, will be sold at a two-pack costing $23.99 and is being hailed as a breakthrough in availability, speed, and cost of testing. So while we might think this might be a little late for these tests to become available, we have significant transmission occurring in the, in the community. And so with even vaccine rolling out, getting access to these tests is super critical. Now, anyone two years old and older can use the test, but they are antigen tests and accuracy is estimated to be about 15% lower than the gold standard PCR tests. Rescue crews are hoping to have a better chance at helping to rescue a whale calf from a fishing line today. That whale calf was stuck. It was discovered Monday off the coast of Laguna Beach in California. Helicopter footage shows the mother whale swimming right to the calf. Rescuers tried for five hours to cut the calf free. However, they faced some challenges, especially from that overprotective mother. Every time we were clipping into that line and we would pull back um, and put any pressure on it, that line would just snap. Mom started to get agitated. You know, anytime you've got a young animal like a calf and people in boats zooming around, putting things in the water, there, there's a level of concern from the mom. Um, she basically stopped allowing us to be on the side with the calf. She'd put her body between us and the calf. Smart mama. Today, they expect that calf and the mother to be near the L.A. County coast, and they hope to get another shot at setting the calf free. Poor thing. And how about this? Snowfall in the springtime. That's what residents in Kansas City, Missouri are dealing with today. This event started overnight with freezing rain turning to snow. Most of the area will have a chance to see one to two inches. It's expected to last until midday today. The snow in Kansas City and Missouri, in Kansas City especially, is over now. But there are places of Kansas that have seen six inches of snow. Yeah, they got hammered in uh, Colorado too. I had some relatives sending me pictures. Absolutely. Now that same system that brought those guys the snow is bringing us much cooler weather by the start of the day tomorrow. For now, though, outside, it feels great. Let's take a look at those current temperatures. 73 degrees at the airport, 78 in Pleasanton, 80 in Catula, and 73 in Kerrville. There's the cold air. It's 37 degrees in Oklahoma City, 39 in Amarillo, 40 in Lubbock. We will be in the 40s tomorrow morning. So this afternoon, getting up into the mid 80s, you'll need the short sleeves at this afternoon, but by tomorrow morning, 45 degrees to start the day. We need, we need, we need rain. I don't think I can say that any clearer. We're under extreme drought in areas in northwestern Bear County, out toward Hondo, out toward Bandera, and down to Catula. Elsewhere, drought 75% of the state of Texas is in drought. In addition to the colder start tomorrow morning, we're going to have to talk about the chance for rain in the forecast, but that chance for rain it's probably going to be better a little bit to the east of San Antonio. Your forecast coming up soon. As more movies head to streaming services, it's forcing the movie industry to take some major changes, make some major changes, what it could mean for you. And Amazon stepping into the beauty business, and we're not talking about products, we're talking about hairstyles, where you can find the new Amazon hair salon. After the break, why this vacation destination is offering a cheap price, a great view, and the vaccine too. Hello everyone, this is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. 
Major League Baseball seeing record streaming viewership in the first three weekends of the 2021 season. MLB TV viewers have watched a whopping 1.3 billion minutes of baseball since opening day. That is a 43% jump since the same period in 2019. It comes even as the league is facing backlash for their decision to relocate the All-Star game from Georgia, that in wake of that controversial new voting law. Meanwhile, in a story you simply can't make up, Dogecoin investors calling for today, 420, to be coined as Doge Day. Advocates attempted to drum up support for the crypto, hoping it will reach $1 in honor of the holiday. The coin, which started as a joke, has surged in popularity of late. It's up over 8,000% year to date. And Oatly AB, that is the vegan food and drink maker backed by celebrity entrepreneurs like Oprah and Jay-Z, has filed for an IPO offering of up to $100 million in the U.S. The valuation is just a placeholder that it's likely to change. Oatly Group intends the list over at the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol O-T-L-Y. And that's your Chatter Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. As more people get vaccinated, many are looking ahead to vacation destination options in some places using the vaccine as a ploy to get people to stay with them. With more details, here's Gio Benitez. This morning, the Maldives, the tourist mecca known for its crystal clear turquoise waters, now wants to be known for three V's, visit, vaccinate, vacation, offering vaccines to visitors. 1.7 million people visited the Maldives in 2019. That fell to under half a million last year. Now they are hoping people will stay for several weeks to get two doses of the vaccine while staying at one of the 500 resorts and guest houses open right now. The offer won't kick in until all of its residents are vaccinated. Right now, more than half of the country has received the vaccine. And other destinations have the same idea, even in the U.S. Nevada has already vaccinated more than 57,000 visitors. And Alaska proposing to start offering vaccines in June at four major airports to anyone visiting. You come to visit Alaska, you get a shot. We'll have things set up at the airport and we'll help you out. So that's uh, probably another good reason to come to the state of Alaska in the summer. They say there are plenty of doses to go around, but the proposal needs to be approved by state legislators. Vaccines are getting a lot of play in the travel industry. Some of the biggest cruise lines like Royal Caribbean, Celebrity, Norwegian, and Virgin Voyages, all requiring vaccinations before boarding Caribbean cruises this summer. Now, we should tell you the State Department is about to add nearly 80% of the countries worldwide to its do not travel list, and the CDC wants you to avoid international travel until you've been fully vaccinated. Gio Benitez, ABC News, New York. Amazon is opening its own hair salon. Before you get too excited, though, there are a couple of caveats. Uh, first, it's in London and it's only for employees. The point of the salon, though, is to try out some new technology like an augmented reality app that shows you what you would look like with a new hairstyle before you actually get it. The house built by Bezos has no plans to open additional salon locations, though the company does plan on letting the general public into the London salon in just a few weeks. Venmo getting on the cryptocurrency craze. Customers can now buy, hold, and sell cryptocurrency directly in the digital payments app. They just need $1 to get started. That can come from existing funds within Venmo or a linked bank account or debit card. Customers are able to choose between four types of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash. The new feature also comes with guides on how cryptocurrency works, which is Probably a good thing. <laughs> Even I would need that guide, I think. Yeah? How crypto How much would you pay for a beautiful day like this? Um, thankfully, we don't have to pay anything for it's it. It's free. It's great outside. It's free. We don't need no Bitcoin for the beautiful weather out there right now. Low humidity. Temperatures are on the rise. We'll get into the 80s this afternoon before a front arrives over uh, the evening hours. And pollen count, you know, we might see some of the pollen go up because of the windy conditions tonight. But the good news is mold and oak are falling. They're moderate in today's pollen count. This is something to watch. The aquifer is down another seven tenths of a foot. 
and we are officially going into stage two water restrictions starting today. What that means is you can only water once a week according to the number that your address ends in. You can only water through irrigation systems between 7 to 11 a.m. or 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. That includes sprinkler systems. However, handheld watering is allowed anytime in any day, and we might get a little bit of water from the atmosphere in the form of rain by the end of the week. I'll have a look ahead coming up. So we're to get a little hint of summer today and then back to springtime or something. Uh, back to honestly, it's going to feel a little bit like winter tomorrow Ooh. morning, David. Ooh. Yeah, we're going to see temperatures tomorrow morning locally in the 40s, feeling in some spots like the 30s because of windy conditions. There is a cold front to our north that'll move through right around dinner time. But before that, we're going to warm up. It's 73 degrees outside at the airport, and it's uh, low humidity too, which is why it feels great outside. I think for it to feel like summer, we would need that really sticky and icky high humidity, but we're not going to get that today. Uh, it does come at a cost, though. The low humidity comes at a cost because with this front arriving, we're not expecting any rain and we need rain with the front, but it's just not going to happen. Uh, 74 in Valley, 77 in Del Rio, already 80 degrees in Cachula and 77 in LaGrange. A wider view here, it's 40 degrees in Lubbock, 37 in Dalhart, 37 in OKC, Oklahoma City. That front is to our north. It's just moved through San Angelo and Dallas, where it's in the 50s now. And with it, there was quite a bit of snow up in Kansas, and there is quite a bit of snow in parts of Missouri. In parts of Kansas, they saw six inches of snowfall. But again, no precipitation with this front here in San Antonio, and it's going to move through right at around dinner time. So before that, we're going to still have plenty more time this afternoon to warm up. That's why I got a forecast high of about 85 here in San Antonio. 82 in Hondo, 80 in New Braunfels, and near 80 in Gonzales. Now, once that front moves through after about dinner, we're going to see those winds really pick up. This is a look at the wind gust forecast overnight and tomorrow morning. Uh, so if you have any light patio furniture or anything like a, a trash can that may get pushed around by the wind. You might want to bring it in or you could be fishing for it tomorrow. Again, wind gust potential from the north of up to about 35 miles per hour uh, tonight and in the early morning hours of tomorrow because of that front moving through. And then this is a look at tomorrow morning's forecast lows near 44 in San Antonio, 45 in Hondo, 39 in Rock Springs and 38 in Kerrville. Now the winds will be from the north gusty at that time, so we will have a wind chill could feel like in the 30s in spots so you'll need the heavier coat tomorrow morning if you have an early Wednesday morning. But then in the afternoon tomorrow, we're going to warm up nicely with sunshine. It'll be in the 70s tomorrow, but by Thursday, we're going to be seeing cloud cover return and even some light rain and drizzle. Unimportant when it comes to helping us out with the drought conditions, but it'll keep things cool on Thursday. Our highs on Thursdays are probably only going to be in the 60s. So cool day on Thursday and then all of our eyes are focused on Friday when we have the chance for scattered storms on Friday with better rain chances east and to the north. But still here in San Antonio, we're calling for a 40% chance for scattered storms. Important to mention, we're also going to be watching out for the potential for severe weather on Friday as well with any of the storms that develop. It's spring after all. We're going the ups and down on the temperatures, but it's going to be a, a nice chance for some storms on Friday. Now, tomorrow, waking up at 45, quickly warming to 70 degrees. Again, those gusts up to about 25 miles per hour from the north tomorrow. Uh, and then on Thursday, clouds return a cooler day with a high only in the 60s with isolated light rain. Friday is when we have that chance for storms. We're keeping our fingers crossed for that, but beautiful and dry by the weekend. We'll be back with more news after the break. More than a year after theaters across the country were forced to close due to COVID-19, moviegoers are starting to return to watch films on the big screen. But with streaming services growing, can the movie business as we know it survive all the changes and setbacks of the past year? ABC's Marcy Gonzalez is in Los Angeles with what some experts are saying. It is the real life drama of a fight for survival, not playing out in theaters, but about them. The coronavirus pandemic packing a financial punch to movie theaters across the country. 
with ticket sales down 80% in 2020 compared to the year before. At least one chain, Pacific Theater, saying it's been hit so hard, all of its locations will stay shuttered. But as other theaters start to reopen at limited capacity nationwide, many wonder if this is the start of a comeback story for this American pastime. I think it remains to be seen whether or not people will will start piling into movie theaters the way that we used to before. Streaming services are playing a leading role in the battle over film audiences. Multiple studios opted to release movies on digital platforms rather than theaters during the height of the pandemic, and it largely paid off with audiences and recognition. After a change in the Academy Awards rules this year, Netflix is going into the upcoming Oscars with 35 nominations, more than any other studio and Amazon Studios racked up a notable 12 nods. How do you put the genie back in the bottle when this whole thing is over? I think there is an appetite for Hollywood to find a solution where streamers and the theaters can coexist. Possible solutions are already being tested. Warner Brothers is now releasing all of its 2021 movies on HBO Max the same day they open in theaters. And it's giving reason for optimism. Box office sales for one of those duly released films, Godzilla vs. Kong, Kong, exceeding expectations and giving a boost to AMC's stock as moviegoers slowly make their way back. The whole atmosphere, the whole feel of being at the movies, I don't think you can beat that. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. Downtown with our own star. Yes. Look at there, you by yourself too. Don't oh. solo today. Hey, you celebrate? know what that means? Something? You know what that means? That means more food for me since, yes, Mike Osterhage has the day off. But Ursula, look at what we have here today. We have got some yummy Creole cooking with a Texas twist on the show. And Sherry Turner, owner of That's It, That's All Food Truck, is here to show off these recipes. But first, Sherry, what is one of the cornerstones of Creole cooking? The Holy Trinity. Which is? Celery, uh -huh. onion, uh -huh. and bell pepper. And you have your own and kind of I twist And I pick it up with right? a little twist. Uh huh. I add a little color to mine. I put the red bell pepper and the yellow bell pepper and the orange bell pepper. And so that's to what give you it know. a little. Because people eat with their eyes, they eat right? With their eyes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, right. ma'am. So what's the difference between Creole and Cajun cooking? It's the spices. Mm -hmm. One is the Cajun is more spicy. Mm -hmm. It has the, with the Creole, it's more of the roux and the the tomato base. All right. It's all right. More, more yes. from Sherry, and that's it. That's all in just a bit because this isn't all. <laughs> 